Most people who have kidney stones have heard of calcium oxalate stones, but did you know that there are several different subtypes and they all form for their own unique reasons? If you're serious about putting an end to your calcium oxalate stones, you're going to want to check out this video. Hi, I'm Joey Weichman and welcome to Stone Relief. Back when I had my first few kidney stones, I had no clue that there were different types and subtypes. Not to mention that there were a long list of underlying conditions that could be contributing to my stone formation. When I asked my urologist about this, I was met with one of those deer in the headlight looks and I instantly knew that I wasn't going to get any kind of useful information out of him. I later chatted with my general practitioner about this too, and all he did was shrug at me and kind of give me a sly smile on his face. Basically, I was barking up the wrong tree, so I took it upon myself to dig back into the research and uncover all the little nuances that were contributing to my kidney stone formation. The game completely changed for me once I started to understand all the different types of stones and their subtypes. I eventually came to the conclusion that understanding the specific type and subtype to your kidney stone is integral to prevention. For example, most calcium oxalate stones are driven by dietary choices, but there are several other components that are seldomly discussed and highly misunderstood that could also be driving stone type formation. So today, we're gonna dive deep into each of the subtypes and variations of calcium oxalate monohydrate kidney stones to understand what could be contributing to their formation. And the first place that we're gonna start is with the most common type of kidney stone. And that is what we're gonna call the type 1A stone. Now, as I mentioned, this is the most common type of kidney stone. If you're watching this video, <laughs> this guy right here, may look familiar, because chances are, again, 80% of the population forms this stone type, so a large population of you is gonna be recognizing this stone. Now, this is defined by its round shape, and they're gonna have like small little kind of budding across the surface here that can appear, and generally they're like dark brown in color. And this dark brown color is really due to the fact that these stone types kind of form intermittently, so there's this on again, off again type of crystallization and then aggregation that's occurring uh, that forms this stone. And there's like urea and the urine pigmentation gets caught up in these crystals, which over time as they build, 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 get darker and darker. Now, if you see a light gray film on the surface of this type of kidney stone, after you've passed it, this is indicative of an active stage of crystallization. Those like little whitish type of crystals on top have not had time to absorb pigment from the urine yet, and that's why they kind of give it that gray appearance. So that's an active stage of like crystallization that is occurring due to secondary hyperoxaluria. <laughs> and cyper secondary hyperoxaluria is all about diet. Now there is a primary hyperoxaluria, which we'll talk about a little bit later with another stone type, but secondary hyperoxaluria is also known as idiopathic. That means we are the ones that are causing it. This is all due to inappropriate consumption of the plant toxin oxalate that I've talked about ad nauseum now, but this is all about diet. There are also some contributing factors to this as well, but again, it only occurs in the presence of oxalate. So low diuresis is one of those things too, and this can be driven by low water consumption, which then leads to low urine passage. And as we know, when calcium and oxalate have got time to mingle, they bind together and they form calcium oxalate crystallizations that eventually aggregate and then they turn into these guys, which are just hideous and ugly. Next chapter, we're gonna talk about the type 1B stone. Stay tuned. Okay, now that I'm over tripping over my tongue, type 1B stones. So, they're gonna look kinda of sorta of familiar to that type 1A stone that we saw in the previous chapter, and you'd be right because they form for pretty common reasons as we're gonna dig into here. Um, but generally this type 1B stone is mostly marked by this like teardrop or oval shape that you see going on here. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get into in a second. But you're gonna notice the same kind of budding structure that's occurring. You're also gonna notice the same type of coloration. And there's also that possibility for the light gray film to appear on the surface during an active stage of crystallization. Now, the cause of this is still, again, diet. It's secondary ox oxaluria. It's the things that we're eating that are causing this. Again, if we're forming this stone type or the other stone type or any calcium oxalate stone type, we lack the metabolic machinery 
to process this plant toxin like the rest of the population. So that is at its root, but there are some other things that lend to this. Now, some contributors here. So there's again, low diuresis present, so low urinary volume, whether it be due to drinking water or some other combination of things. Again, allowing calcium oxalate to mingle and crystallize and then aggregate into these guys. Now, the difference in shape though, because this tells a story, and this is why we're talking about these subtypes, because this oval shape here should be screaming out to you already that there's something else that's amiss, because otherwise it would be that round shape like we saw with the type 1A stone. And this is indicative of a transition from the stone that moves and started probably as a calcium oxalate dihydrate stone, which is another type of stone we're going to talk about in another video, to a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone. So there's a bit of a hypercalciluria hyperoxaluria battle going in your body. So basically hypercalciluria means there's excess calcium in your urine. This favors dihydrate formation of the calcium oxalate stone type. Whereas when you have excess oxalate in comparison to calcium, it favors the 1A type of stone formation, which is again, what we saw previously. So this shift over here towards these, this is indicative of switching from a calcium oxalate dihydrate type of situation Moving over to a hyperoxaluria state, where now we're talking about a monohydrate type of formation. In the next chapter, we're going to dig into the stone type that goes over primary hyperoxaluria. Stay tuned. All right, I want to introduce you to the type 1C calcium oxalate monohydrate stone type variation. Now, as I had mentioned previously, this forms as a result of primary hyperoxaluria. And this is super, super rare, and thus this kidney stone type is also super rare. Now, the shape can vary pretty dramatically. There is no real consistency here, but there's gonna be a little bit more type of prominent budding as you'll see on some of the surface areas. And that really doesn't signify much for our concern, but nevertheless, it's just identifying that stone versus the others. And again, you'll notice that this is kind of a pale yellow color versus that dark brown. So there's definitely something that stands out here. Now, additionally, these stones can go from this pale yellow and they also might show up as clear. And it's not to be confused by the kind of like white color of a calcium phosphate stone. Like this is straight up clear color stone. And this should scream to your urologist that this is a sign of primary hyperoxaluria type one. And generally people who have this they're aware of it because they've probably been suffering from it for most of their life. And it's a really incredibly unfortunate position. But in essence, uh, there is a genetic malfunction with the way that our livers synthesize certain elements. And we basically produce oxalate on our own at high levels. Uh, so much so that it binds with free calcium in our body and then they form these kidney stones at an alarming rate. And this can also mix with other types of calcium oxalate monohydrate and dihydrate stones as well. And it gets really ugly from there. And this is typically when people are also eating a, doxalate, a diet high in oxalate in addition to the oxalate that they're producing in their bodies as well. And it's just not a good situation. But nevertheless, again, these are super, super rare. And it's three in one million in the population. So damn near like unicorn status level. But if you're recognizing this and you seem to be having recurrent kidney stones like over and over and maybe diet changes aren't working for you should be having a conversation with your doctor about primary hyperoxaluria type 1 because there are some medications that can slow the formation there's no known cure but you can slow down the rate at which they form which is very very high which can provide at least some sort of temporary relief in the next chapter, we're going to dive into the, the type 1D stone. Stay tuned. Just a reminder, this information is available in written form on our website. Find the link below in the description. Okay, so meet the type 1D stone. And if you've been paying attention, you're going to notice that these guys look a little bit different than the rest of the family, and they're a little bit of a black sheep. And there's a reason for why they look the way that they look. But let's start from the top here. So these are not very, very common, and you're going to find out why this is in a second here. But nevertheless, they are really defined by the round, smooth shape. Honestly, they, like, when you look at them, it almost looks like pea gravel. It's like 
is that actually a stone or do you just pick that up off a playground? It is that different from the rest of the stones that are formed out there. Not only just in the calcium oxalate family, but just period, all stone types. So they're really odd looking. And this should jump out to you as like, oh, this is this kind of stone. Now, they're going to be beige in color. And again, this is also due to the way that they form, which is generally driven by, again, secondary hyperoxaluria. It's calcium and oxalate getting together in our kidneys and forming these stones. However, there is some sort of impediment to urine flow that you're experiencing that is causing these stones to stay in the kidney for longer than most other stones would stay in the kidney. So these are things like a malformative uropathy uh, where you've got some sort of an impediment in your urinary tract, which is again, slowing down uh, urine passage. And this is typically not on both sides of the urinary tract. So it's typically one kidney or another or something that may have occurred. Uh, but that is generally what is occurring there. And there's also a situation where it's just stasis. And this is again, related to hydration primarily. You're just not drinking enough water at all and just barely drinking enough water for you to survive and just you're keeping all those stone forming elements kicking around in your kidneys which then crystallize and they aggregate into stones and then when you've got a bunch of them and they typically form in multiples they rub together <laughs> and then they form that smooth surface so this again is a really rare stone and again you would typically know that you have some sort of malformative uropathy if you're getting this stone type and that would cause you again have a conversation with your doctor about what could potentially be done to try to solve this um, and again if you're not willing to make dietary changes this is some sort of a surgical aspect but if you're willing to make dietary changes solving this type of stone type and all the other calcium oxalate stones with the exception of the stone that is primary hyperoxaluria driven it's very easy. Just stop eating oxalate and you won't get these kidney stones. Next up, we're going to talk about the last one, which is the type 1 E stone. All right, last but not least, meet the type 1 E calcium oxalate monohydrate stone. Now, these are also pretty rare. Um, and you probably noticed that there's a theme here. Outside of that first one that we talked about, that type 1 A stone, the rest of these are really pretty rare. And again, these are mostly driven by the fact that there are some contributing conditions that can be associated with this for people who are still having oxalate in their diet. Now, these are going to be oval shaped, but they're really marked by more prominent type of budding. So every calcium oxalate kidney stone, with the exception of the last type, the 1D stones that we talked about, is going to have some sort of minimal budding that's occurring. But this one is just kind of like a cauliflower almost. It's just like pop, pop, pop. Lots of little budding that's occurring up top there. So this is really kind of points out like, hey, what's happening here? And if you see this, you're likely got something else that's going on that is at the root of this. And in addition to secondary oxaluria, I'm so, sorry, secondary hyperoxaluria, which is the diet aspect of it, there's also something called enteric hyperoxaluria. And this has to do with how your body digests oxalate. And again, oxalate, if you're forming calcium oxalate kidney stones, is not appropriate. So don't eat it. But if you continue to do it and you're kind of seeing these kidney stones, there's a reason for why. And there's something going on digestively. So in particular, people with IBD or Crohn's typically see these type of stones. If you've had a portion of your digestive tract removed, which is like an allele resectioning, uh, this is also going to screw with your body's ability to process foods appropriately and to just, you know, absorb nutrients and in particular like not necessarily oxalate being a nutrient but its absorption is going to be impacted also chronic pancreatitis can be involved here and then lastly type 2 diabetes is also a piece of this puzzle and most of these things again if you fix your diet and you eliminate oxalate this can be solved but i know that a lot of this stuff especially if you've got like a stone type that's mixed with a bunch of different things it can be confusing as to where you go and what you do next to try to solve this problem. I know that I spent years struggling to figure out what I needed to do to put an end to my kidney stone. So if you're interested in shortcutting your results and just coming to the point where I am right now and stopping kidney stones and getting your life back, head on over to our website and book a coaching session with me. We'll assemble a plan to make sure that you not only prevent your kidney stones from ever coming back again, but we'll also make sure that you're probably improving a lot of these other factors that could be declining the quality of your life. So head on over there and change your life. Visit our website if you'd like to join a community of people learning to manage their kidney stones naturally. See you in the next video.